tend to remember that at the very last minute. Yeah. I don't see Cindy. Oh, yes. Who is that? Cindy? Cindy. Yes, it is. Hi, Cindy. Oh, so glad you're able to make it. Neat. <laughs> I was beginning to wonder if I would. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, all right. I don't know if we can go live on Facebook at the same time as YouTube. So that's going to be the answer to that question. I okay. have to research that more. So I think we say hi to everyone here and get started. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Dry Eye Happy Hour. I'm Rebecca at the Dry Eye Foundation. And in the office next door to me is Aidan Moore, also from the foundation. And we have four panelists today who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. For those of you that are new to Dry Eye Happy Hour, this is just our way of getting people connected at a very isolated, disconnected time and having conversations about the realities of our journeys through dry eye disease in its various shapes and forms. Um, it's a place for us to share how we navigate and what we've learned, how we're coping and our visions for things that we can change, things that we'd like to see get better. So today's topic is a real zinger, elective eye surgeries. So we're talking about things like LASIK and blepharoplasty. Um, many of you know this is where it all started for me with an elective laser surgery almost 20 years ago now. Those of us who have had dry eye specifically from some kind of elective surgery, we have so much in common with everyone who's got dry eye, of course, but yet it's also its own unique experience. It has some features that we kind of only share with each other. So today uh, we have a slightly larger than usual panel. Actually, we were hoping for a fifth. Um, we've got people who've had LASIK like me. We've got people who've had blepharoplasty, our eyelid surgeries for cosmetic reasons, and people have had eyelid or other surgeries for medically necessary reasons. So we get to explore this from all angles and see how our experiences compare and see what insights we can glean from pooling these experiences. So just really grateful to those of you who volunteered to be on the panel today. I'm really excited. So let's get started. Um, we have Nick, Rob, Tracy, and Cindy, and I'm gonna ask each of them to share our usual intro question. So what state you live in, what you're drinking, how long you've had dry eye, where you're at in the journey, um, and what eye drops you use last. So let's see, I see you first on the list, Nick. Go ahead and tell us about yourself. Well, hello, uh, my name is Nick. So I am out of the state of Wisconsin um, near the Green Bay area. What beverage am I drinking? So I just have a, honey green tea that I'm drinking uh, right now. I got, got a water by me as well. Nothing, nothing too, too special as, as far, as far as that. Um, as far as how long I've had dry eye, it's been since February of 2017, roughly. Um, that's when I, I had LASIK um, and the symptoms of dry eye started, um, very shortly thereafter, probably within two weeks to a month um, is when I started to experience um, what I would consider dry eye or what I had never felt those kinds of sensations before. Um, when it comes to where I'm at with my dry eye journey, so doing the math, I'm roughly three and a half years um, into this journey. Um, Many, many doctors and specialists and different paths in my journey from pain doctors to neurologists, optometrists, op ophthalmologists, um, feel like I'm making incremental um, steps in the right direction. It's a bumpy road as it is, I think, for a lot of people who go down this journey. Um, so still still moving forward um still looking for answers though um as i move forward um and the last question the eye drops i use last um so i just actually use some oasis ovance <laughs> tears of, of some kind some artificial tears was my my last one before this meeting or might have been the autologous serum tears one of the two was uh my last ones all right thank you nick 
Rob, your turn. You should be an expert at this truncating this story by now because you Rob's been a, a repeat. I'm gonna go short. I'm gonna go short. Okay, so <laughs> I am uh, I am coming to you from the ghost town of New York City. Um Sorry, I'll leave the political references out of it, but I am drinking uh, two things, Atkins strawberry shake because I forgot to eat today and Diet Coke so that I can um, actually have something that doesn't taste like what that tastes like. Um, I've had dry eye and been in Rebecca's circle since um, 2007. I had LASIK, Originally back in 1995, it was a very new procedure. I was actually writing about it as part of a magazine assignment. Then about 11 years, and it, and it was, it worked out relatively well, but around 11 years later, I went back for what they called at the time enhancements. And that set me on a very bad path forward. Um, and uh, Nick said something earlier that I hear that I heard from myself a lot and that I heard was pretty, pretty common, um, which is that the visual aberrations came first and the pain came, se the pain came second. Um, and the last eye drops that I used, we'll call, well, well, they were, it was a Soothe Ointment PM, which I just popped in for this meeting because um, even though I'm being asked to wean off of them, uh, I'm reluctant to because I like, I like Soothe Ointment so much in the evening. So that's where I am. All right, thanks, Rob. I was just relating to the vision first, pain second thing too. I mean, I think that happens a lot with LASIK. I mean, my vision, 48 hours later, vision was a train wreck, but pain didn't kick in in a big way until about the three month point. And I remember after that reading why that is, but I just, if you didn't know, you wouldn't guess that that is, is fairly normal. Okay, I am moving clockwise along the screen. Cindy. Oops, I almost forgot Sorry. to unmute you. <laughs> I had you on mute. Um, well, my name is Cindy and I currently live in Pennsylvania. I've been here for 10 years. Prior to that, I lived in northern Wyoming where it is a very arid climate and the wind blows a lot. So that is not a really good place for dry-eyed people as you can imagine, but um, through the years I did manage. Um, my dry eye history goes back a long time, um, almost 50 years, believe it or not. And um, what started the dry eye journey is really difficult for me to pinpoint a starting point, but it was probably in my teenage years. I started wearing um, the hard contact lenses when I was 12. Uh, the optometrist thought I was showing signs of keratoconus. Um, I had very unusual corneas, and I also was quite myopic and my vision was worsening rapidly as I was entering adolescence. So he put me in the rigid contact lenses, and um, in the teen years, I started having a lot of comfort problems, a lot of erosions, a lot of um, abrasions, and the optometrist thought it was because I was um, um, abusing contact lenses. Uh, fast forward into my 20s, things worsened, and I finally received the correct diagnosis of lattice dystrophy. And I also found out then in my 30s that the lattice dystrophy that I have is actually part of a larger systemic disorder. Uh, the dystrophies are complicated and there are subtypes. And I got the one that was a, a subtype of a larger systemic issue. And it is believed that uh, the amyloid deposits from that systemic disease also um, affects the lacrimal glands. So my dry eye is caused by a combination of aqueous deficiency and MGD. And so it's been a real challenge over the years to manage um, both. 
and uh, struggled a lot through my 20s. My early 30s were terrible and um, had the punctal closures, did fairly well with that. Uh, then I had surgeries in my 50s uh, for worsening lagophthalmus, which is a part of that systemic disease uh, that occurs as people age. And um, things just uh, got worse from there. And then we added more eye disease with glaucoma and uveitis and uh, corneal ulcers. And I finally got uh, scleral lenses about six years ago. And I'm managing the dryness fairly well with the scleral lenses. But uh, the glaucoma has really complicated my care a tremendous amount. And um, long story short, to wrap my story up, I have started the journey of um, oculoplastic surgery to correct uh, some of the uh, surgeries that were done years ago to deal with the early leg of Um So I just had my surgery uh, three weeks ago. And I will add, though, that through the years, I've had numerous other eye surgeries, the cataracts, lots of glaucoma surgeries, um, other surgeries, and whether any of those surgeries contributed to further dryness, we really don't know. Um, a lot of it is trial and error. And um, currently, my dry eye is being managed. I can't wear my scleral lenses right now because of the oculoplastic surgery. So I'm back in bandage contact lenses, which are a huge challenge. Uh, for those of you who have ever worn soft contact lenses, that's essentially what bandage contact lenses are. Um, as far as what am I drinking, I am drinking an herbal tea. It's Bengal spice, and I have a scoop of collagen powder in that to uh, help promote corneal health. Whether that really works or not, I'm not sure. Um, and that's kind of my story and, and the journey I've been on, and I think we could do probably a whole happy hour on the challenges of dry eye disease in the setting of other complex eye diseases. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, um, Cindy. I, one thing that you mentioned that I feel like I hear a lot from people who have had any kind of eyelid surgery is that um, there's so often these additional eyelid surgeries to go back and fix what was done the first time or the second time there. There's just a lot that, that goes on. I think Tracy could probably speak to that too. All right, Tracy, your turn. All right, my name's Tracy. I live in Rhode Island and I currently drinking filtered water. I don't drink any sodas or anything else that might have sugar in it. Um, my dry syndrome uh, journey began because I was highly, I was born highly myopic. Um, my vision was like 2400 and wore the thick heavy glasses, you know, the black plastic frame. And I can remember how heavy they were on my nose and on my ears when I was little. And um, I started to wear, my mother had bought me the hard contact lenses when they came out, I think in 82 or 83. And I went to get fitted for those, and those were a disaster. My, my eyes were so irritated all day long. I love the fact that I, wasn't, I didn't need to wear glasses, but I suffered all day. So I had to get refitted again, and I finally got a pair of hard contact lenses that, that worked for me, and that was, that was pretty good. And then eventually they came out with soft contact lenses, which was much, much better. Um, as I got older, I decided to have some cosmetic surgery done. And so I had the upper eyelid surgery done and I was very happy with it. It came out, you know, when I went back to work after, uh, maybe a week or so of healing, um, my friends and coworkers says, oh my God, your eyes look so beautiful, you know? And I think that was in 1997, 1996, something like that. So, um, and I'm always concerned about my appearance. So I went ahead and had another eyelid surgery done 
maybe five or six years later. And, and that went very well. Uh, as recently as 2015, I went to the best plastic surgeon, cosmetic surgeon in Rhode Island. And, Say, uh, Tracy, yeah. so sorry to interrupt. I'm hearing from people that are having a little difficulty hearing you. Is it possible to turn up your volume or oh, it might know more about this than me? Right, let me, yeah, let me check my microphone level. Hold on. Yeah, you may move closer to your mic if you're using the mic. How about that? Is that better now? Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay. I am so sorry. sorry. About that. All right. So um, anyway, I had two cosmetic eyelid surgery, just the uppers. And um, so that was the first one was like 96, 97. And the other one might've been 2002, 2003, whatever. And then I had my third, well, before I had my third um, cosmetic eyelid surgery, uh, I had developed genetic cataracts when I turned 50 or right around 50 years old. And um, I was diagnosed in August of 2005. And my optometrist says, oh, you have the beginning of a cataract, but it'll be 15 or 20 years before you'll need any surgery. Don't worry about it. That December, I could not see out of my right eye. I needed surgery. That's how quickly it matured from August to December. So that was my first cataract surgery, and that was uneventful. Took 15, 20 minutes. I was, I believe I was awake during the surgery. Uh, then they give you an array of eye drops that you know you have to take for several weeks. And, and before that, uh, my, my um, soft contact lenses were monovision. Uh, when I went from eyeglasses to contacts, and then I, I needed my reading glasses. So I transferred one, uh, my soft contacts to um, bifocal contacts. And um, that, that worked okay, but I wasn't really happy with it. So my optometrist said, oh, do you want to try monovision? I says, well, what's that? He says, well, one eye will adjust for moderate to long distance. And then the other eye we adjust for close. Mm -hmm. And after about a week or so, you know, your brain will figure it all out and you should be okay. So it took me about two weeks to get adjusted to the monovision contacts. Then I had cataract surgery. I wore mono contact lenses for at least five or six years. So when I had the cataract surgery, my ophthalmologist says, you wanna stay with the monovision? I says, absolutely. So when they implanted the, uh, the lens for the right eye it was for distance and moderate. Two years later, I needed cataract surgery in the left eye. Uh, that surgery went awry. You know, 98, 99% of all cataract surgeries are uneventful. Well, they punctured when they were breaking up the capsule or the, um, when they were breaking up the natural lens inside the capsule that holds the, the lens, your natural lens inside your eye, they, they destroyed that or they, they broke that capsule. So they had to find, my ophthalmologist had to find another place to place the lens within the eye because that capsule couldn't hold the lens. So and I, Tra I, Tracy, ahead. So sorry, I'm gonna ask you to fast forward now to okay. kind of where you're currently at with dry eyes so that we can- Okay, I told you that I get carried away. So. <laughs> uh, where I am right now is that um, I'm back on mistasis eye drops and I use anthromycin ointment at night when I put a piece of saran wrap over my eyes with a night mask. And sometimes I, you know, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes I have to wake up in the middle of the night because my eyes are still dry. So I put more drops in, I put the saran wrap back over the eye, put the night mask back on and try to get back to sleep. Uh, so what I'm using now is for stasis, uh, refreshed tears and the omega-3 uh, refreshed tears, which is a thicker gel. So that's where I'm at right now. Some days are, are really bad. Like I can put drops in every 30 minutes or hour and it doesn't help. And then some days I can tolerate it. It's, it's not too bad. All right, thank you so much. But it would be really interesting to add up the number of surgeries that we here have collectively had. That was gonna be a pretty high number. A lot, a lot going on here. So, okay, yeah, from... <laughs> um, 
for me, it was just, no, actually, I've even had more than I'm thinking because there's the original LASIK, there was the corrective one. I had a canaliculotomy back in 14, heading into cataract surgery. Shortly, I actually finally scheduled my consult for that. All right, so thank you everybody for sharing the background of this and where you're at. We're gonna go ahead and head into our questions. There's so many memorable things about our experiences after surgeries that go some in some way awry um, or have a, a significantly worse than anticipated outcome. Um, there's the interactions with doctors and what those are like. There's sometimes difficulties getting diagnosis and treatment for whatever has come out of it. There's the pain factor, which for all of us with dry eye tends to be pretty big. There's the emotional side of it. I mean, when it's an elective surgery, for a lot of us, that's the big zinger. I mean, and it's which part of the scale are you on? There's the guilt piece, there's the anger piece. And some of us are kind of one or the other, some of us are both. There's fear, there's frustration, uh, depression and anxiety are just kind of taken for granted. That's part of the, of the picture. There's just a, a lot there. So where we're gonna start today is I'm gonna ask each of you, um, and to pick a particularly memorable um, aspect of your experience with the surgery, um, something that had the most memorable negative impact in some way, something that was very unexpected or very disturbing or what it was. It could be before, during, or after, or even long after. Um, and if you could just pick one of those and share about that. Um, Rob, I'm gonna call on you first this time. Okay. Well, the short answer to that question is there came a time when I was being treated at a major urban hospital where I had had the surgery done, where after a couple of months of seeing me and my complaints, the doctor sort of said, you know, there's nothing we can do for you here. You might want to look into scleral lenses. Um, there were a ho there were a bunch of other problems. And because of Rebecca, at the end of the journey, I ended up in scleral lenses, but there were a lot of things that needed to be done beforehand. But the lowest moment and what really set off um, two years of very severe depression was basically just when the doctor who did the surgery and who I had a lot of faith and confidence in kind of said, there's nothing more I can do for you. Um, and it deteriorated to a point where um, I was still working full time and I would take the subway a few stops into my job and I, I, I couldn't get up off the subway seat. Um, I was so shut down by what was happening. So that's the short answer to the question. And the only other thing that I'll add here, if we wanna to touch on it later, is that at least 50% of my conversations with Rebecca over the last decade have been about uh, the emotional components of this um, as compared to the physical components. I have a lot of things I'd like to say about that if there's an appropriate time. Absolutely, we will circle back to that. That, I don't know, it's just profound for me. The, there's nothing more we can do for you here. I just, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from someone as being just devastating words to take in in a doctor's office. And sometimes, I mean, there's so many other ways something like that can be delivered. Um, you know, in my particular tool set, I've run out of things. I know there are others who have more. I've got three names for you to call. I don't know, there's some out, some, some ray of hope that there's more, that we are not limited to what this one particular doctor knows. But when, when that message comes across that, okay, you've reached the end of the, end of the line, because I think that's kind of what we internalize, isn't it? Here, we, we hit the end of the line. Okay, so that was huge. I'm gonna circle back there. Um, Cindy, a, a particularly memorable negative experience during or in the aftermath of, of a surgery that you've had just this is interesting to me from the contrast because you've had a lot of medically necessary surgeries. Well, I've had many medically necessary surgeries, but uh, there have been two really negative outcomes that I will never forget. And it's hard for me to decide which one to talk to or to, to talk about. Um, but I think I'll choose 
the negative outcome and the rather unexpected outcome that occurred following my uh, first cataract surgery that I had in 2005. I developed, excuse me, I developed early cataracts because of the years and years of uh, the steroids that I had to use for my corneal disease. So when I was still in my 40s, I had my first cat or my cataract surgeries, and we did the right eye first. And my corneal specialist and I talked at length about the risk of my, that cornea eroding um, because of the dry eyes and, and the corneal disease that I have. So he tried to do everything that he could preventively to avoid that from occurring. Well, after the surgery, of course, he put a, a bandage contact lens on it. And unbeknownst to me, that bandage lens fell off sometime either during the night or shortly after um, I left the doctor's office when I had the uh, surgery. And I had to go back the next day, and I, I knew I was in trouble the, the second I got up that morning. And the, the cornea had eroded severely, and it was a major um, serious erosion. And um, I, the, the bandage lenses would not stay in my eye, and we could not get that um, eye to heal. And we ended up having to do a temporary and a complete tarsorophy, where they actually sewed the eye closed. And I had to have that uh, sewn closed for about three weeks. And uh, I started developing what looked like cellulitis in my face from the sutures. And so we had to remove the sutures. The erosion was still not fully healed. And it took the entire summer. I had the, the uh, cataract surgery done in May. And it took until August for that cornea to heal. So that was, that was quite major. Um, I did not get an infection in that eye, but the cornea had eroded probably two-thirds of the cornea. And so I was left with very blurred, uh, distorted vision for, for just months on months. So when it came time to do the left eye, I was really apprehensive about doing the, the left eye um, a few months later. And fortunately, the left eye did not erode as badly. It still eroded, but we were able to keep that erosion uh, much smaller. So having a corneal disease and having any of these surgeries always carries a risk of things not going quite as planned. Well, that must have been terrifying. I mean, just the sheer, I don't know. Yes, it is. <laughs> it definitely is. Um, when I had the erosion after the cataract surgery and it wouldn't heal, uh, we tried to get it to heal for a couple of weeks. And the day that I went in to see the corneal specialist, uh, when he told me that I was out of options and we were going to have to sew the, the uh, uh, lids closed completely to get it to heal because he said the epithelial seal cells had started to roll under. And he said, once they completely roll under, the cornea will not heal at all. So I knew what that meant. <laughs> if that happened, it would be transplant time. So we, um, we did the tarsorophy and, and fortunately it did heal, but it took far longer than what the um, doctor had anticipated. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm glad it did eventually heal about that. That was quite, that was, that was an ordeal. Wow. Nick, switching back to the LASIK world, talk to us about a memorable um, aspect of your experience. Yeah. And, you know, um, something that Rob said too, about the um, running out of options sparked memories too. I've encountered that um, in my journey. And that is, that is a very, uh, feeling of defeat when you hear that or or even just when you come to the realization yourself that you're not really getting anywhere and it's like okay back to the well to start searching the forums and finding a different doctor and going through this whole process and um, not really having a 
smooth referral process or well there's these seven other options if this doesn't work so another subject but I was just going to say I totally felt that um, <clears throat> I think the the biggest thing for me that that I go back to um, played a lot of video games uh, and stuff as as a as a kid and even growing up and there's always that reset button on the Nintendo or whatever that you can hit um, and after I had LASIK you know even that night when I woke up I knew something was very, very wrong visually. I didn't have the pain yet. Um, and you go into a procedure like that and you kind of think, well, if things don't go right, they can fix it. Like, right, there, whatever goes wrong, there's something they can do to make it better. Of course, I never considered pain. Um, I never had considered that. Um, but certainly I had somewhere in my mind thought, well, visually, they are doing something to my eye. So obviously that could be a side effect or something. So I, I was kind of prepared for that, um, but not the pain part. And then realizing that there is no reset button. And as the weeks go by afterwards and I'm not getting results and now the pain is coming and the visual stuff isn't going away, you, you can't go back, right? It's not, it's not like a video game. You can't just go back to the day before and, so there is, um, that was a huge piece for me was there was the guilt. I made a choice to have a procedure. Um, I, I was, you know, encouraged to do so, but I still made a choice. I didn't have to. Um, and then having both this visual piece followed by the pain piece and not being able to um, start over. Uh, and then, you know, going down the road of, of trying to, to find relief. So, I mean, that, that really stands out to me. And it took me probably, probably at least the first year to just, you, you, you know, you accept that this, this is your new reality, whether you like it or not. Um, and you have to find a path forward. Um, so I, I guess that would be what I would say is the one thing that stands out for me. No reset button. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I, as you were describing that, I'm mentally thinking back to 2001 and I'm remembering actually when I was putting together a list of questions for the surgeon and going to basically interview him and um, the whole, what are the outs in case anything goes wrong? That part was really important to me. And he was the surgeon supposedly that was the go-to for all of the other surgeons who had patients with complications, they would come to him to get fixed. And that was my comfort level came mm -hmm. from that, knowing that what's broken can be fixed. Wow, okay, Tracy. I know I cut your story a little bit short, but I think when we were talking the other day, um, you had described about a one of the later, a, a, an upper eyelid surgery that you had um, where you had a bad outcome. You were struggling with the aftermath of that. I don't know if that's what you wanna share about on this question, but it just kind of came back to me. Yeah, well, um, I certainly can relate to anybody, especially Nick's story about the elective surgery, going for eyelid surgery for the third time. Um, I should be, it's a 50-50 thing. I should be angry with myself for doing it, but I should, I'm also angry with the surgeon that I went to who knew my history with myopia and cataract surgery. And I didn't, I um, didn't mention this, but I've had six retinal detachment surgeries on my left eye. So my left eye is the worst one as far as dry eye syndrome goes. And um, so my ophthalmologist, um, he evaluated me. He puts like this, like a litmus paper or whatever on my eye to check for the tear film. And I basically didn't have any. So he sent me to another eye specialist uh, surgeon who does the lower, the lower lid because they didn't think my eyes were closing. And at night when I was sleeping, that air was getting up, up underneath my eyelid and drying everything out. So I went to uh, see this, this surgeon and he said when they gave me anesthesia and I fell asleep, partially I guess, he noticed that my eyes were not closing. So he, he went ahead and did surgery on the lower lids to try to lift the lids together so they would close 
while I'm sleeping, but um, that surgery didn't work. You know, he tried, but it didn't work. So, you know, when Nick says that, you know, you can't hit the reset button, there's nothing else that you can do or they can do. So I'm just hoping that there's a new technique, new surgery, new drops, transplant, you know, or whatever that I can get. So I don't have to deal with this. This is only one layer. I have a multitude of medical issues, <clears throat> but the dry eye syndrome is one layer. And um, I just wish I didn't make that third choice. I'm back, back on for the eyelid surgery, you know, the cosmetic and the elective surgery. So um, that's what I can add to. But I did go through six retinal detachments and luckily the macular was never affected. So I do have 20-30 vision. I can read without glasses, can see, can drive. But the dry eyes, every day I wake up, I have to put drops in my eyes. Uh, before I go to bed, I put drops and ointment in my eye. And there's really bad days, like every hour you put drops in and it doesn't help. Or some days you put the drops in and it's painful just to put the drops in. Even the drops don't help. You know, and it gets frustrating. So sometimes I use warm compresses and what have you. So um, that's what I can contribute. You know, if you're gonna go for elective surgery, I don't care if you go to the best doctor in the world, but if you have a lot of pre-existing conditions, you better weigh all the factors and the risk and say to yourself, is this really worth, you know, you know, for appearance sake to have this cosmetic surgery done, you know, especially the third time. So that's what I bring to the table. Oh, thank you, Tracy. So much to think about and talk about there. The best surgeon in the world part too just gets me every time. One of the most memorable things for me back when my stuff first happened was how everyone everywhere just assumed that you went to a bad surgeon if you had a bad outcome. And it just wasn't the case. It seemed like everyone I found online who was struggling with the same things as me we went out of our way to seek out really good surgeons and bad stuff happens even when we, when we go to the best. So I'm still mulling over the guilt and anger thing and still going to circle back. I'm just going to do, get into one other question first. And then I really want to come back to that part. Cause I just think it's a big part of the journey. Um, how has your experience changed, if it has, um, how you feel about ophthalmology. I mean, for some people, having these bad experiences with an elective surgery changes how we view medicine in general. Um, anybody want to raise their hand that would like to speak first to that? All right, Nick, go for it. <laughs> um, you know, I... I'm kind of, I guess, unique in the fact that, uh, maybe not unique with this group, I, I shouldn't, don't know, but I've had, um, I had health conditions since I was a child, so I wasn't um, unfamiliar with the healthcare system and, and some of the nuances and, and negative pieces of it where maybe struggling to get appointments or dealing with insurance or all of those elements that aren't great um but certainly the past three and a half years took that to like a level that i never realized existed and i'm sure many people that would listen to this are on this panel of just um really having to navigate the world um this this eye world and this disease in a kind of like self-referring, going on the forums and making lists of different treatments, researches, what's the future going to look like, you know, all of these things. Um, I think in three and a half years in the countless doctors I've seen, I've main, mainly only had one to two actual referrals. Everything else was my own research and navigating and talking to people. Um, Rebecca and I just talked, you know, had a conversation about this. Um, so there's a, you know, a real, I think, need for, for there to be more connection within ophthalmology, more referrals, more if this isn't working, there's this doctor that's doing these kinds of things. Um, so I think that that really needing to just be educated and research and self-advocate and all of those things was um, a big part of 
of this for me and, and changed how I, I did view um, ophthalmology and, and um, healthcare in general. I, I also would add too, just, you know, before I went through this journey, I, I, I never realized how complex the eye was. I, I never realized how, you know, it's in, in 2020 and there is still so much, um, I think, to be learned. Um, there is still so much room to grow, um, whether it's eye pain or visually. Um, I remember I, I had a friend probably 10 years before I had LASIK. He had some issues with one of his eye with, with a blood vessel, ended up losing um, all of his central vision. And then he only had peripheral. And I just remember thinking, well, they have to be able to fix that. I mean, it's, it was like 2015 or something. And I'm like, how, how can they not fix it? Um, and, and you kind of come to this realization that with some, obviously some conditions are, are more, more fixable, I guess you could say, or, or there is more, more options out there. Um, but others is, is not so much. So it's, it's, it's just, um, just a really challenging, it, it's, I'm sure it's exciting from, I try and <laughs> frame it positive, it's exciting that there could be all of these advances, there's still so much more room to grow, but of course when you're in the moment, <laughs> you want the solutions now and you're saying to yourself, there has to be, um, we have to do better than, than the way it is now. So that, that's kind of just my overall thoughts on that one. Right, thank you. Rob. <laughs> yeah, I just want to jump in on that. Um, Nick, thanks. You're, you're bringing me back about eight years and the road still sounds and looks very familiar um, on that front. I, I've kind of come to break. Okay, so you get out of that appointment where you realize the doctor, you know, the doctor's kind of saying, I've done what I can do. And with, with the hindsight of looking back 13 years on it now, I've, bro I've always broken it down into three areas. Um, and there may be a Buddhist element to this, one of my friends once said, but don't quote me on that. There's kind of, okay, do what you can. You talked about um, the research and the reporting and do what you can. What's within your control is such an incredibly important part of this. And it comes with an adjoining risk of doing too much. Um, we have so much information available to us online and Dr. Internet is a terrible doctor. Uh, Dr. Internet did not get a medical degree, um, probably from some little place in the Caribbean that you would not want to go to, but um, I apologize for that. It takes money and time, which are resources that not everybody has in abundance to run down all of the suggestions and referrals that you get in the initial stage of an ophthalmic disease, whether you're talking about your halos, your starbursts and your aberrations or your pain. And I have to tell you, I've spent 13 years going back and forth on the source of the pain that resulted from LASIK. Um, Rebecca and I both knew a wonderful man, the guy who founded the Boston Foundation for Sight um, named Perry Rosenthal. And he really did a lot of the early research into neurop corneal neuropathy. Um, and then there's this whole other issue of MGD. And I was fortunate to have a doctor for 10 years who was really, really into it. The man was in his, the man is in his seventies, but talking to him, he has the enthusiasm of a teenager discovering cars for the first time. So there is, I, and I, I spent five years trying to get an answer to the question is the pain that I'm experiencing coming from my eye or is it coming from my eyelids? Because I couldn't tell. People would, great doctors I would call and go to visit would say, well, lift your eyelids off your eye. You know, does it, does it hurt? Does your eye still hurt? If not, then your problem's in your eyelids and things like that. And, and I eventually came to the conclusion that there were issues coming from both places. Do what you can can take a very long time um, and a lot of money. And it's, it's a very hard thing running down the different things that people do to deal with these things. First, the visual issues, because the visual issues hit you first, they terrify you. The starburst is not being able to drive at night. What can I do about that? And maybe you land on scleral lenses or maybe you land on 
um, a more sophisticated PRK procedure because somebody tells you they can smooth out the bumps on, on the surface of your cornea. Um, after do what you can, there's kind of the accept what you can't part. That's really the second part that Rebecca and I, that I've talked to about quite a bit with Rebecca. And that's kind of where this becomes an emotional issue. And I'm gonna wrap it up, Rebecca, but I just, I just wanna say that um, I think that a lot of doctors, a lot of traditional doctors, probably older, um, tend to want to avoid discussions of therapy or antidepressants. Um, it's, it's not their field. They didn't go into ophthalmology to learn about antidepressants or therapy. Um, I think those can be important components of healing from this. Um, I'll stop there for now. I may want to come back. I may ask if I can come back to it. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. I have a couple things I want to comment on, and then I want Tracy and Cindy to have a chance to share. And then we're going to, yeah, we'll circle back to some of these. Nick, something you said about the just not realizing how complex the, I was and just the things that aren't known. I mean, it's one thing what I don't know, and even what my eye doctor doesn't know. But I think a lot of us come into this with no reason, no way of understanding how much simply isn't known, period. I mean, back when I was having eye pain 15, 20 years ago, we didn't even have language for that. There wasn't a diagnosis for it. There just, this wasn't known. That's one of the things that Perry Rosenthal pioneered. Um, now it's becoming better known, but there's a long ways to go. One of the things I find myself saying a lot, talking to people lately is, think about this as emerging medicine. I mean, when I look around and I see the number of topics related to what we go through that simply aren't fully understood, <laughs> that's what it is. There's just so much more to learn. Um, Rob, you said something about Dr. Internet, and I just can't keep myself from commenting on this because I want to make a comment about Dr. Facebook. Uh, <laughs> you went to an I, even more medical school, yeah. I mean, Facebook groups, are wonderful for some things and terrible for other things. And they can take information that may be good information, bad information, or simply not specifically relevant to me information, and they can amplify it. And I, I really find it disturbing to see like thus and such a doctor has thus and such a protocol. And apparently everyone who goes to them seems to get on that protocol or so you would believe if you believe everything you read on Facebook. And then that protocol gets shared and everyone goes out and tries to follow it. I just want to get in people's faces and say, wait a minute, let's get back to basics. You want to get in front of a doctor, you want them to examine you and decide what you need, not simply follow the protocol that was appropriate for someone else. So anyway, there's just a lot of, lot of the, the, the internet is so good and so bad um, and so necessary for us as we're journeying through anything unusual. We just, we have to learn how to navigate it safely and wisely and not get overwhelmed too by what we get from it. All right, Tracy, I know you raised, raised, your, raised your hand uh, when I first brought up the question. So how has your experience with the surgery changed how you feel about ophthalmology? Um. This is my takeaway about it. If, if you're going to have an elective, an elective cosmetic surgery on your eye, I highly suggest go to an ophthalmologist that specializes in eye surgery. Just don't go to a general uh, cosmetic surgeon who can do surgery on the eye or surgery on the face or surgery on the neck or whatever. Go to an ophthalmologist that specializes with cosmetic cosmetic surgery on the, on the eye. Uh, that's what I, that's my takeaway from that. Um, the other thing is I forgot to tell you that my experience with, um, the cataract surgery, the, the, um, the one that went awry in my left eye was very, very painful after the anesthetic wore off. And also my, another, uh, the cataract surgery was very painful, extremely. And one of my retinal detachment surgeries where they had to laser the entire uh, retina back onto the eye. When I woke up out of surgery, I was in so much pain they had to give me uh, morphine and morphine was not enough. So they had to give me more than what was normal. 
to relieve the pain. So that was my experience with laser because I first had laser in the office and I didn't have a problem with it, but as she got closer to some nerve, it, it was like a branding iron on my eye. I just couldn't withstand it anymore. So she sent me to the hospital to have the laser surgery. But when I woke up from that, I was in a lot of pain, an awful lot of pain. So yeah, if you're gonna have elective surgeries of any, any sort, it's not always the best doctor that advertise as most advertising or whatever. Check the fine print on those agreements that you sign as far as surgery and side effects and liability issues and make sure you know what you're getting into before you make that decision. Uh, that's, that's what I can say. May I jump in for a moment? Tracy, are you done? Yeah, go ahead. You just touched upon a really intelligent point. Um, the ophthalmic community, doctors in particular, um, have presented nearsightedness and farsightedness. Oh, you're minus three. Oh, you're plus four. As a medical disease, it's no more a medical disease to be nearsighted or farsighted than it is to have brown hair or blonde hair. It's a feature of your person. It's just a feature, right. I agree with that. Doctor's office, who I still walk into, some of the best people I know who treat dry eye also advertise LASIK and PRK in their, in their rooms. And I have to bite my tongue from chewing them out because I'm there asking for their help. And it's really mm -hmm. not a great way to start a relationship with a doctor by saying, hey, mm -hmm. stuff in your waiting room is BS and it's going to cause a lot of people. But we are really, really conditioned over the last 20 years to believe that visual deficits are a medical problem. They're not a medical problem. There may be a minor inconvenience. There may be an inconvenience. I mean, I went through everything I went through because I found it difficult to wear these. And I wanted, I thought it would help my career if I didn't have to wear glasses and it was annoying. And I just wanted mm. everything to be simple. Um, it, just the idea that being nearsighted or farsighted is a disease is perpetuated is when some, somebody earlier talk, talked about 50, Tracy, it was you talking about 50% blame and 50% what you're responsible for. And I think mm -hmm. that, that that's such a key thing to notice because at the end of the day, yeah, Nick, like you said, we do make our own choices and we are ultimately responsible for our choices, but there is a lot of nudging in the direction of some of our choices. I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could do a whole entire session on advertising and um, oh, informed consent and all these things too. There's just, there's a lot there. It's a, it's a bottomless pit of issues for sure, but that wasn't mm -hmm. to get into. Um, Cindy, do you have something to share about this? How just any shifts in how you view, view ophthalmology or ophthalmologists as a result of any of your experiences? Well, so much of mine, of course, has been uh, medically necessary, but I would like to add back in the mid-90s when LASIK was first approved by the FDA, I actually considered it, given my corneal disease and that I already had dry eye disease. And I actually did go to see a, an ophthalmologist who did that surgery, and I laid everything out on the table to her of what my issues were. And I asked her, is it safe for someone like me, given all of my eye diseases that I have, uh, to do the LASIK? And I remember so clearly her saying, yes, yeah, theoretically, it is safe for you to have it done. And I just looked at her and said, well, theoretically just isn't good enough, I don't think. And then I pushed her a little bit further on it to find out, did she actually have any patients that she had done LASIK surgery on that had the same kind of corneal disease that I had? And she said, no. So I left the office that day knowing that there's just no way that I could have that. But interesting that I would even consider doing something like that, right? But I, I wanted to get rid of the glasses. I couldn't wear the contact lenses anymore. And I missed that, you know, cosmetically we want to look nice. But uh, that was, I always had felt that that was a, a bullet that I dodged. Yeah, you owe yourself a round of applause for that. That takes incredible self-awareness. I wish I'd had you with me. I, 
Uh, you asked the right question. How many people would know to ask that question, though? Have you done this successfully on somebody like me with this particular right. picture or that? I mean, how many of us would have known the right question to ask? But that's the one that revealed the flaw. I mean, you can find any number of studies in all the medical journals. LASIK is safe and effective, blah, 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 blah. But not necessarily for me. <laughs> That's, that's exactly right. And, and the other thing that I would also like to add, um, the same as what Tracy has said, if for anyone considering any eyelid surgery, even if it's being done for a medical reason, to see an oculoplastic surgeon for the surgery. And don't just go to one for a consultation. I went to three before I decided who I felt would be the best for me. Uh, the second ocular plastic surgeon that I went to had recommended a very, uh, what I felt was just too, too extreme. Um, and, and I just knew that there was no way I could do that. So uh, I, I would get at least three different consultations before deciding. And yes, yeah, so back to what Rob said, it takes time, it takes money, uh, it takes travel. But it's, in the end, it's worth it to do that research. I have spent a fortune over the years, as I know others have too. I love that you brought up the question of multiple opinions before these. That so helpful. And yet, with LASIK, I sometimes see people get tripped up in that process too, because um, how to compare the opinions that they get. If my rule of thumb, when somebody's come who's considering LASIK and has been uh, been to a couple of doctors, because people do come and ask, and I mean, it's hard sometimes answering them, um, is, you know, if, if there was one surgeon they went to who said, no, I wouldn't do this on someone, on you because of thus and such. And then they found three others immensely qualified who said that they would. And so they conclude that this is safe for them because the other doctors that they went to said that they would. I mean, what I tend to tell them is, hang on, <laughs> have you listened to that thing that the, the one doctor said about why they wouldn't? Um, it's hard to right. think, it's hard to interpret that information because are you getting um, better information or are you getting more aggressive a more aggressive stance, someone who's willing to take more risks with your right. It can, it, it can get very confusing once you start getting multiple opinions and trying to sort it out as to which one of them is right. Yeah. I, the one that's going to be most conservative to keep your eyes safe in my book that's always going to be the one to follow if possible. I mean, when you're talking about elective surgery in particular, because yeah. that's a whole and, different ball game. And that's what I did with this most, this most recent sur oculoplastic surgery. I went with the most conservative plan. Nick, I think you had something you want to share on this. Yeah, just, just real quick. Um, I, I'm, I'm starting to see more, which, which I think is promising. Um, you know, it's not always just, you know, visually or, 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 or what, what, what they're seeing in your eye, whether you may or may not be a good candidate, you know, they're learning more and more about systemic issues such as autoimmune conditions that could be pre-factors, you know, or, or, you know, factors for why you, you shouldn't pursue an elective surgery. So um, I did have autoimmune conditions going into mine and there's autoimmune conditions across a wide variety of spectrum. Um, so, you know, we don't really, there is no conclusive, you know, this autoimmune means this, that, or the other, but um, I think that's a relevant question and, and topic. It's not always just the eye, it's what else do you have going on within your body? Um, other sorts of issues, maybe even something like a depression or anxiety or different kinds of things. Um, those need to be part of the, the conversation as well. And sometimes I think those are often not thought of or, or, or ignored, but they are relevant. And 
I certainly going into it would have never thought that my autoimmune condition might have anything to do with what the outcome would be. Um, but it very well might have. I mean, I don't know, but it, it, it could have been a factor. I'm thinking back to kind of in the early 2000s, the people I got to know who had LASIK done in the 90s who had Sjogren's or RA or these other major things where in the following years, it became well enough known that those put you at high risk that most doctors backed away from doing that, not necessarily even because of dry eye as such, um, but because it would compromise the visual outcome, which has always been the driver for LASIK. Um, you know what amazes me? In 95, when I had it the first time, this is gonna sound like an, oh my God, grizzled old man story. You know, they weren't using an intralace laser or anything to cut the flap. They were using a microkeratome. Have any of you ever sliced an eggplant? What's the, what's the, Sean would know, he's out in the hallway. What's that great kitchen tool that I never buy, but I always see it, it's about a hundred bucks and it makes really nice slices. Help me someone. Mandolin. Thank you. <laughs> Mandolin, okay? A microkeratome is essentially a medical mandolin. So rather than cut the cornea with a laser, they're using a microkeratome to, to measure the depth. And somewhere in my, um, in my nothing bad can happen to me 25 year old mind, I said, okay, that sounds cool. You know, I'm getting, I'm getting work out of it. It's for an assignment. That's fun. It, that's uh, just an amazing thing to think that I even considered it, so. Okay, now we're going to move. I mean, I know we've talked about this already, fam, but we're going to go specifically tackle the guilt and the anger with elective surgeries. And I'm just going to say it for myself, it's all about the anger. I, I know that guilt is pervasive for people who've had an elective surgery that's gone awry. I've heard it over and over. It's, I did this to myself. I, ah, oh, it's just so excruciating to think about or guilt because of impact on people's families or this, that, or the other. For me, I don't know, somehow my brain just never, man, my emotions just never managed to go there. It's just maybe anger is just a more natural outlet for me generally or what, but I, anger was my major aftermath of LASIK and so many things can continue to trigger that. That is the reason that I ended up starting the dry eye zone because I wanted to get out of that world festering in anger and um, go to a kind of wider pool of us that have dry eye from, from other reasons too. But for, I know for a lot of people, guilt is a bigger thing with it. And like I said, many have both. Um, who would like to tackle this first? I know you would. Anger help. goes. <laughs> Trace, I'm going to give this one to you. As far as what? anger goes? <laughs> Either of them. Pick, a, pick an emotion and talk uh, to it. Well, let's start with anger because um, look what I've done for the rest of my life. That's something I have to live with. And, and I love to read and reading books is difficult because your eyes are stationary. They don't blink a lot. And, and your eyes get dry very quickly. So you can't really... You can't really concentrate on what you want to read and it takes you longer to read a book. And since I'm in the science community, I read a lot of technical things and uh, it gets frustrating. Um, for me to read a book, I used to read a, a book in a day, you know, a couple hundred pages a day. Now I'm doing maybe 15, 20 pages, put the book away, put some drops in, do something else and then go back to the book. So it's taken me a long time to, to get through a book or to learn a new topic or a new subject in, in astronomy or science or whatever. So I'm angry about that. I regret what I had done, but I can't let that anger ruin the rest of my life. So I have to live with it and do the best I can. I have to move forward. I, I cannot look back. I really can't because I can't change the past. I can't change my decisions. So what do I have to do? I make the best of it and move on. And, I, and I'll preach that to everybody else. And let's just hope that medical science comes with some breakthroughs for us, for all of us. Um, if they come out with a bionic eye, 
Um, I'll give it a try. I wouldn't mind, but uh, that's what we have to do. We have to, we have to go through the frustration. We have to go through the anger, the anxiety, get it out of our system and move forward because there's nothing else you can do about it. And you can't, you know, just sit here and just muddle in it all the time. So you got to move on with your life. Life is short. You have to make the best of every day. Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. All right, Rob, go for it. Hi, me. I'm going to do this in 30 seconds or less. Okay. <laughs> Look, there are no therapists who specialize in people with eye problems from elective surgeries or non-elective surgeries, but there are plenty of therapists and social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, psychopharmacologists who specialize in treating people who are disabled or who have medical problems. And a lot of those same issues will translate over to the things that you experience or that a patient with these blame issues will experience. So it's safe to seek out therapy in more general terms, okay? And if I have 10 seconds left on that 30 seconds, um, it also comes down to two other things. You have therapy and you have medical therapies like antidepressants and responsible good doctors are gonna tell you that some of the antidepressants on the market can contribute to, to, to dry eye or to mm -hmm. eye problems. And they ain't kidding. Um, they're, not, they're, not, they're not toying with you. And the best conversation that I ever had on this front, right around the time that I was finding myself unable to get off a subway was a doctor, a, a younger female doctor in the practice of my older male doctor, who is the greatest doctor I've ever had in my life, um, but who just didn't want to talk to me about antidepressants, called me and we had a long conversation. And she said, you know, right now for where you are, I think you sometimes need to choose the lesser of two evils. And maybe you want to try the antidepressants and see if that exacerbates the condition you have. Because right now, I think you've got larger problems than the depression being caused by your eyes. Um, I took her advice. It was good advice. OK, 40 seconds, 45 seconds. That's awesome. Not trying to, to cut oh, you down no. here. This is the the topic, the, the lesser of two evils thing. Yeah, I. to me, it comes down to there, there comes a point when my head hurts more than my eyes. And it's okay to prioritize that because it'll help me deal with my eyes as well to get my head in a better place. I can navigate the medical world better. I can navigate every aspect of life better if I'm getting some help for what's going on in my head. These things matter. Northeast thing, you know? I feel like in New York and Boston, people are a lot more comfortable and, and the coasts probably just talking about therapists and antidepressants. And I don't, Nick, is there anything that, do you, have you discussed this with anybody? Do you mind if I ask? I don't, I don't mean to pry, but does it come up in, in your circles or your conversations? The, like the, like counseling or the use of yeah. antidepressants? Either, the counseling. Does anybody even suggest it? Is it part of the, the, um, the general discussion around these issues in Wisconsin or wherever? Yeah, you know, I, I think you are probably spot on that on the coast or the bigger cities, it, it might seem to be a more, um, you know, acceptable or, you know, seeking mental health in, in general. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a two-sided coin in, in a way, because you don't, I've also kind of run into where the, the pain is, um, well, it's, it's in your head. So just go talk to someone as, as, as if the pain and the experience isn't real, you know, so there's that fine balance, right? Because I actually, I do have a, a master's in counseling. So I'm fully embrace uh, counseling. But I also understand that there can be physical things that you're going through with medications or other sorts of treatments. And there's the worlds have to work together. Um, and the the last pain doctor that I'm currently working with, they actually do a good job of trying to integrate counseling with medical therapy, um, which I hope to see more of where we can complement each other um, in that world versus 
you've run out of options here. You're still in a 10 out of 10 pain every day. So go talk to someone because that can leave people feeling pretty disappointed and, and, and lonely too. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good, to, it, it's good to um, bring up though. It, it's, it's a great topic and it needs to be more like acceptable like that that can be a piece of of getting better because as you all noted there's a deep piece of guilt um anger i think for me it was disappointment too just just disappointment and let down that i'm having to navigate and do all of these research and referrals and traveling to different states and i'm doing it all on my own feeling like except for obviously my my, my friends and family who've been there for me but just that it's not been medically guided. Um, th that's been my, uh, you know, biggest thing. It's just disappointment. Like who is in my corner referring me and, and, and make, and wanting me to get better. Um, it's, it's been hard to find at times within the, um, you know, the medical community. So hope I answered your question, Rob. I know I kind of went off a little bit on a hey, you gave a great answer. You gave a great answer to my question and you taught me a couple of things. So thank you. That is really awesome. I just wanted to pick up on what you said, Nick, about the, the pain is in your head thing. Um, a couple of years ago, um, it was a year ago, I forget now, time all blends together somehow in the COVID world, but I was at a medical conference and there was a terrific, terrific talk about corneal pain and um, including people like us who have it after LASIK. And um, it's Lynette Johns, who um, worked for a long, long time for Boston site. And she pulled this thing apart. And by the way, the room was packed. So there were a lot of doctors really interested in this. I mean, there were people standing up in the back. Um, she went through and she looked at this from a medical standpoint and just debunked a lot of things for the doctor friends. She went and she looked at... Um, um, malingering and somatic symptom disorder and what they really mean and what the difference is when somebody's got real corneal pain that you can't necessarily see on an examination, see obvious reasons for. And it was really interesting to hear her educating doctors about why you never, ever, ever want to just assume that somebody's pain is in their head, about the, just the reality of corneal pain being a very real thing and, and how you try to validate it. So it's just one of my favorite events ever to hear someone speak so well to that. Okay, um, I guess one other thing I was thinking of when one of you were talking was that the need to reach out to more health professionals and you know, so that can be on the mental health side and um, it can be our PCP, it can be anyone in our life medically too. I think there's such a danger with dry eye of getting hypnotized by all these eye doctor visits into seeing ourselves as a pair of disembodied eyeballs. And we know this thing has a broader impact on our lives and it's, I think it's to our benefit to talk with any doctor we visit about this and get their perspectives. We don't really want our eye doctors being the ones prescribing or prohibiting us from choosing an antidepressant medication or, or anything else. We wanna to get to the appropriate professionals for it. Okay, I'm looking at the time now and what we're gonna to go to to start wrapping up. This has just been such a full discussion, by the way, just so grateful to all of you. Um, I want to hear your advice to others going through a difficult time after a surgery. What advice would you give your younger self? What advice would you give someone um, who's in the midst just based on what you've learned through your experiences? Cindy, I'm gonna start off with you. Cindy, can you- so what, would I tell, what would I tell my younger self? To get through the the difficult times, I get, well for me, I my situation is is way different than a lot of yours because when I'm having a lot of um, pain, it's visible because that's usually when I have either a major erosion or um, ulcerations 
or they can measure my eye pressures and see that they're 50. So it, it, it's visible and it, it's um, objective data that they can see. And how to get through those times, I guess, it's just one day at a time. It's one minute at a time. And there have been many, many times that I could do nothing but uh, try to look at the ceiling um, and just wait it out and know that I'm doing what I can do. And I think that to get through a lot of the tough times, I had to do a lot of visualization um, and, that, and the positive affirmations that I can get through this. I'm going to be okay. I'm doing everything that I can do. Um, last year, 20 months ago, when I had a really serious ulcer, I had to visualize the antibiotics working on the bacteria and on the, on the I had to take amphotericin B because I also had a fungal infection in my eye. And I had to visualize the medicine just killing off all the microorganisms and had I done some of that way back in the beginning, I might have coped a little bit better. And I also want to add, to with all the mental health issues that um, you all were discussing earlier, and I also mentioned this to Rebecca in, in the past, I cannot recall one time when one of my um, ophthalmology specialists have asked me how I'm coping. How am I doing? Uh, do I need to talk to someone? No one ever asks that. And I think that is such a huge component, even for those of us that it's so visible that we've got a, a, a big problem. Um, and I think part of what has happened with me over the years, I can go in and more times than not, I can be stoic, but the minute I get into my car, I will crumble. That, I, ever since we had that conversation where you mentioned this, Cindy, about I can't recall a time when one of my ophthalmologists asked me how I am, asked me how I'm coping. Um, I've just been noodling over that ever since. And that's kind of what I had in mind when I talked about how we come to see ourselves and be seen as disembodied eyeballs where we need validation that this is something that impacts our whole person and our whole lives. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. they're, 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 they're really missing that piece because they, you know, you go in and you, you see a, a packed waiting room and they're just, they're having to, to get you through and, and deal with, the medical issues that you have that you're dealing with at that time. And I, I think a lot of it is a time issue for them. Right. Um, so just picking up the, the, the advice that you had, the taking time in small increments, a day at a time, a minute at a time, and the visualizations. I think those are, that's super helpful. Tracy, what's your best advice to someone going through some of the things you've been through? Well, I, like I say, I had multiple issues. I got chronic sciatic pain, um, um, bilateral plantar fasciitis on top of the dry eye syndrome and TMJ. So um, which you don't wanna isolate yourself and just sit in the house between four walls and just say, oh my, what am I gonna do? Uh, reach out to somebody. My ophthalmologist never asked me well, he says, how's your eyes doing? I says, they're, they're dry, but he never asked me about any support groups or help or anything because I guess he assumed I was doing okay. But my PCP did suggest that I see somebody, you know, see a counselor for um, basically my chronic pain. And then I was able to uh, bring up my dry eye syndrome and my other medical issues. So it's always good to reach out uh, maybe to a friend or a family member at first. And if that's not helpful, a support group like the one we joined or the Dry Eye Foundation. And um, because you can't do it alone, you can't go it alone. You need support, um, you need that crutch and you can't stand on your own two feet by yourself. It's, it's, it's very difficult, if not impossible. So I suggest to reach out to people, friends, family, a professional counselor, join a support group like we have and, and share our experiences to help us through. 
That's excellent. Thank you. Nick. Yeah, I, I could probably go on about this one for a while. I, I echo the what, what has been um, stated. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I guess at the end of the day, it, it's not your fault. You know, there, there's a guilt component here, but, um, you know, I, I think if, obviously if I would have known this or it would have been laid out differently, different decisions would have made, we all go into these things well-intentioned. Um, so, you know, that, 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 that's the first piece, it's not your fault. Um, you know, give yourself a pat on the back for each day that you move forward, that, you know, you, you, you know, you can keep, continue to live your life and you kind of take the, the small moments and the small successes and you celebrate them. Because one of the things I've learned with dry eye is I haven't found anything that's just been a magic, uh, magic wand and everything is great. It could just be small little pieces, incremental pieces that build towards um, getting your life back slowly um, and steadily. Um, I, I would add just on a, a note from, for myself and my journey over the past three and a half years, you do have to, or I have had to learn to be my own self advocate, um, get educated. Um, I feel bad for those that might be listening and thinking, oh, I gotta learn all of this stuff. And I, and I feel badly because it shouldn't be that way. Um, but it, for me, it has been. I've had to learn about treatments, options, doctors, medications, because sometimes I might be the one going to the doctor proposing a solution that I have discovered um, and, and trying it out. Um, but with that being said, because we've talked about the, the, the forums and education, and, and, I, and I do want to say that... Um, the forums are great, and, and, I, and I encourage you might have to become a part of those to learn and understand, but I also just want people to remember that just because something didn't work for someone else on the forum doesn't mean it won't work for you. It's very easy to fall into a, you see a comment about a certain treatment, it has 10 likes and three people saying it didn't work for me, and it's easy to write it off and say, oh, not going to work for me then. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, it isn't the case. There, there could be many people it worked for. And, you know, I've talked to many people along this journey who have had success with different treatments and they don't, Rebecca and I are talking about this. They don't always come back to the forums and post and say, oh, I'm better now. You know, they're, they go on and they live their lives, you know, oftentimes because there is some trauma here and, and, and that's okay um, that, that people move on. Um, so you, when, when you're, when you're part of a support group or the forums, just, you know, try to use it for educational purposes, for supporting others, for building others up. Um, but keep in mind that, you know, you can get better. You, you know, certain treatments can help people along this journey, even though it might not always feel that way from what you're reading or what you're experiencing. Thanks, Nick. I'm... So we've got, it's not your fault, celebrate small successes, and then this, be your own self-advocate. These are just terrific advice, but this last one too, that's profound that just because it didn't work for this person or these 15 people in a Facebook group, that has zero implications for whether it will work for you. And these different treatments are not just some sort of checkbox either. They're... Each one of them has its nuances, different dosage, different this, different, different that. So we don't want to cross things off our list prematurely. I think that's that's really important. All right, Rob, and I always feel kind of guilty because I feel like there's so much we have to hold in because there's only so much we can cram into an hour or so. But go for it. What's your best advice? And yeah. Oyster chamber glasses, period. <laughs> what he's doing right there. If I'd, if I'd started using them five years earlier when people started suggesting them to me and I was like, I, I don't think I can do that and do my work, um, I could have spared myself. What I could have developed was a calmness that would have put away the anxiety that forced me to light to make a lot of really bad subsequent decisions. Moisture chamber glasses, probably, they're the face masks of a dry eye disease. They will alleviate a significant number of number of symptoms. Uh, 
with a hell of a lot less financial investment than virtually anything else you're going to do. Oh my God, I love that. The face masks of dry eye disease. And it just goes right to the heart of it. I mean, the thing that we need when we're in pain is a reliable way to get control of that. Ugh. Thank you so much, all of you. This is just a really good, really rich session. I just really appreciate everything all of you have contributed to this. Um, just lots of great positive things to carry forward from there. Just, I just marvel at what happens when we get to pool these experiences and see what we learn um, from those experiences collectively and what is helping, what things when we look back, what things help help us the most to get through. All right, gonna start wrapping things up here. Our um, next session is gonna be November 6th and this is all gonna be about dry eye at work. And we need volunteers for this one. I've got one person who committed months ago and um, she's gonna help us explore things like uh, reasonable accommodations at work. And I'm really excited about that. But I know, you know, most of us under a certain age struggle with working with dry eyes. So I know there's lots of people with lots to say. If you would like to share about your experiences at work or about the things that, that help you at work or how you've navigated hard things at work, even things like disability. Sometimes people need to go out on short-term disability, sometimes long-term. Love to get your input to that session. So let us know that's gonna be November 6th. Um, after that, November 20, we're gonna talk about the need for validation and this one I think is universal to our dry eye community. I, who has not experienced someone, maybe it's the eye doctor or eye doctors or coworkers, sometimes sadly family, friends, um, not taking our experience as seriously as we do, simply not understanding um, and feeling that it's a much more minor thing than we know it to be having lived with it. So we're gonna explore the topic of validation, the, the need for it and where and how we find that. So if that's something, a topic that speaks to you, you've got something to say about it, love if you would join us then. Um, let's see, Aiden, can you share some other ways people can connect also um, in addition to the dry happy hour? Yeah, you touched on happy hour. Nick has been talking about the forums and Facebook groups. Um, we have a couple other things here. I have a website that I've been working on with Rebecca called Dry Eye Stories. And these are um, written stories from people who've gone through lots of different journeys. Um, you can check that out at dryestories.com. <clears throat> um, and you can kind of see where other people have been and, and search by the title or tag or content of their story. Um, those are sometimes good for sharing with other people who just don't have the, the same experience or, or understanding of, of what you're going through. Uh, we have a dry eye survey at mydryeyedata.org, I believe, or .com. can't quite remember. Um, but work, yeah. <laughs> work. It's a, a long-ish survey about um, diagnosis, treatments, all sorts of things that can kind of help give context, um, helps us um, with research possibilities, but also can hopefully help you get some context. And um, then lastly, there's just us at the Dry Foundation. We have email, we have phone support. Um, you can browse our website, dryfoundation.org, um, but always just push people to email or give us a call if you wanna talk because Rebecca's really generous with her time um, and, and can go over some of these things. So I think that was everything on my list. Thanks, I do wanna echo the you know, call. If Nick talked about the importance of reaching out and not isolating, if uh, not everyone can do or wants to do with social media, reaching out is hard. If you don't know where to reach out to, you know, we're here, I'm here, just call. <laughs> Love to talk with you. Um, last, the thing that our board is pushing me to do. If you are finding these helpful and you're looking for a way to give back, you can always donate on the foundation site. It's dryafoundation.org. There's a donate button there. Other ways to give back, just volunteering to be on a panel. We love having people join. You can also send us ideas and um, requests for topics for us to cover. All right, well, Cindy, Tracy, Rob, Nick, thank you so much again for being with us today and everything that you shared. 
And You're so very welcome. Thanks a lot, guys. It was really nice talking with you. You as well. And uh, shout out to Cindy, too, for recruiting some of our panelists today. She's helped so much with that. Oh, Thanks, I Cindy. Kidding. Thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend. All right. Take care and be safe. Thank you. Thank you.